Peace, family, and assalamu alaikum. Thank you all for showing up. Uh, today we would uh, be having a great show. Uh, today we would be having a great show. And uh, hopefully you all enjoy it. Uh, we are uh, again at, at the top of the clock. And uh, we can still wait for uh, Dr. Wesley. Uh, so just sit tight. Uh, and say it. It's going to be a very good show. We want to, as many as people as possible to be able to come in here and hear this message by our dear brother, student minister, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Uh, we appreciate you for being here and uh, retweeting and sharing. family we are going to be getting started shortly thank you all again for joining this space and look forward to this discussion I'm a brother, Dr. Wesley. Wa alaikum salam. All praise due to Allah. We will begin shortly.
Brother King Cam, just let us know whenever you're ready. Praise be to Allah. Okay, as we get started, thank you, thank you, thank you again. It's your brother Malcolm. Uh, we have a special guest with us today. We have our brother, uh, who is an esteemed guest, uh, by the name of Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Um, Dr. Wesley Muhammad, our brother sits on the executive council of the governing body of the Nation of Islam under the direction and guidance of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan, and is also a part of his research team. Our brother, Dr. Wesley Muhammad, has you know um, done a lot of great work. Um, he's a, a esteemed scholar um, that is not only uh, nationally uh, recognized, but I would like to think and and and, and know that he is globally recognized in many scholastic circles. Um, this this brother has definitely have the enemy trembling in his boots. You know what I mean? And our brother is, you know, a, an amazing brother aside of, you know, the scholarship aspect of everything. Just as a person, he's a, he's a beautiful person. He's a family man. He's a father. He's a brother. You know, and uh, and I'm grateful to have our brother in this space. This is a brother who I have uh, myself looked up to for a very long time. Um, and, you know, and I look at my brother as uh, my mentor as well. And many of us uh, in the Nation of Islam and in the collective. And um, so I would like to uh, bring our brother on, um, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. Dear brother. Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> As-salamu alaykum, Brother Malcolm. How's my brother? Wa alaykum salam. Doing fine, sir. And yourself? I'm well. I'm well by last grace. And the same greetings to my brother, Brother King Cam, and all of the collective, in fact. All praises is due to Allah. I think Brother may be having some, some technical difficulties. He was, he was up here. But I'm not. I'm not sure exactly uh, where he is at at the moment. Um, you, you you couldn't hear me. Oh yes, yes, we heard you. Oh, you oh, you're us? speaking of King Cam. Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. I was I was just letting you know. Um, I think he's having technical difficulties, but he should be right back. All right. Praise belongs to Allah. Yes, sir. So. Um, to all our guests, again, thank you all for showing up. You know, um, this conversation, we want to correct the Malcolm X narrative. Um, we have a list of questions that we want to ask our brother, Dr. Wesley Muhammad. And uh, also, we will do a QA and a se uh, session at the end. So if you can, please hold your questions till the end of, you know, our show and conversation. Our brother is willing to take uh, questions from the audience. Um, nothing is uh, going to be scripted. You know, we just ask that you uh, show this brother, you know, the utmost respect. You know, um, this brother has put in the work over 30 years doing this work. You know what I mean? This brother has been around us, you know, fighting on the, uh, on the 
fighting in the cause of freedom, justice, and equality and liberation. So we will ask you to be respectful to him, be respectful to yourself. And if you have a question, please direct the question um, based on uh, the, the conversation. You know, we right now we're not taking any reparations questions. None of that. If it's not related to Malcolm X, we, we, we won't, we won't, you know, acknowledge it, you know, um, and we would just have to move you back down to the audience. Um, so, um, sister Tamara, you're on stage. Did you want to say anything before we begin to Dr. Wesley Muhammad? Y'all, are y'all there? I don't, can y'all hear me? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Okay. All right. Um, so let's get into some of these questions. Okay. The first one, Dr. Wesley, two of the key components in the false narrative of Malcolm X, Malcolm's assassination that is highly constantly, Mal constantly is Malcolm's knowledge of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life and, and the silencing of Malcolm after the assassination of JFK. There are said to be the biggest reasons Malcolm left the Nation of Islam. From your research, can you provide what you have found that either supports these notions or dispels them? Yes, sir. Um, can you hear me? Is my vo is my volume good? Yes, it's it's perfect. Okay. Praise belongs to Allah. In the name of Allah, who came in the person of Master Far Muhammad, to whom my holy praises are forever due. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And I bear witness that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad is his living and exalted Christ. And the Honorable Brother Minister Louis Farrakhan is their Messiah in our midst today. And their names, I, I greet all of your, our listeners now with the greeting words of peace as we say it in the Nation of Islam of As-Salaam Alaikum. Um, Wa Alaikum Salaam, sir. Brother Malcolm, I, I appreciate the question and all questions um, that will be brought forward by you and by others let me if I may start by contextualizing my work in particular um, and then I will get right to your question yes um, sir thank you we are correcting the narrative and so if you noticed on my Instagram page, in addition to my personal Instagram page, I started a secondary page entitled Correcting the Narrative. That is the page where I will uh, park a lot of my the material that comes out of my Malcolm X project, a project I've been on. For nearly 30 years now, what most people don't know, the very first book I ever wrote, some, I wrote it in 1991, 92, in preparation for the release of Spike Lee's movie, that very first book I ever wrote was on the assassination of Malcolm X nearly 30 years later um, we are still engaged in this Malcolm X project the aim of which is to correct the narrative you know, the dominant narrative of Malcolm X the scholarly narrative as well as the popular narrative it's a false narrative and of the items of this narrative that needs correction. Uh, I've identified four main areas or five pillars. It could 
be said of the Malcolm X false narrative. The first, of course, is the circumstances and consequences of Malcolm X's discovery of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life. You're asking about that, and Allah willing, we will get into that. Second, the circumstances of Malcolm X's departure from the Nation of Islam. Those two pillars, if you will, of the Malcolm X false narrative, or, or those two um, incidents in the life of Malcolm X, has been used to create a lot of mischief by those who have an axe to grind against the nation of Islam. And they really target those two aspects of Malcolm X evolution, evolutionary history, um, target those two to create a lot of mischief. Number three, in terms of areas of this narrative that needs to be corrected, the identity of the aggressors in the subsequent, after Malcolm left, there was conflict that developed between him, his followers, and the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the FOI. But the, the false narrative has misidentified the aggressors in this conflict, in the media and in the street conflict between Malcolm X and the FOI. We are correcting that aspect of the narrative. Four, um, Malcolm X feigned discovery of white Muslims and of true Islam, quote unquote, when he went to Mecca. And five, of course, the most important pillar of the false narrative is how the forces behind and responsible for the assassination of Malcolm X has been identified. They have been identified incorrectly. And so these matters, the false narrative of Malcolm X, um, hinge or on these matters, the false narrative of Malcolm X hinges. And so our Malcolm X project um, seeks to correct the narrative by focusing on these particular pillars of the false narrative as we have it today now. Um, Brother Malcolm, you mentioned uh, Malcolm's knowledge of or discovery of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life and then the silencing of Malcolm after the assassination of JFK. Those are two critical moments in this story and they are two moments that are more often than not abused by so-called Malcolm X scholars. So we can take one at a time and feel free, Brother Malcolm or Brother King Cam, to jump in at, at any point. Um, and, and let me give this caveat. Many have heard me say a truism that I constantly repeat. God is in the details and truth resides in nuance. Have you heard me say that, Brother Malcolm? That's one of my favorite quotes from you. Yes, sir. One of the... It's my humble opinion most of the bad history that's done around this subject is a consequence of a lack of due attention to detail. Now, one, why I bring that up here, I am a stickler for detail. Detail 
clarifies matter. I will pay, Brother King Cam, I will pay $300 for a 400-page book. I do. I have routinely. And if in those 400 pages I get nothing but a single detail that's relevant to my subject subject or to my study then that four that three hundred dollar investment was worth it god is in the details i say that because when i'm asked to speak on this subject if you don't have patience to listen then you are going to stay in a state of frustration as you listen. The details clarify the matter. The details dispel the confusion. So I walk through these matters. What Carl Levans, for example, does. What Zach Kondo, for example, does. Is run roughshod over matters that should be treaded slowly to unpack what's really going on in 1963, 1964, 1965. But by running roughshod over these matters, demolishing the detail this relevant to the circumstance, that's how misunderstanding is born, and that's how this false narrative is created. So I put that out there because these matters are deep, they're important. There's a lot of detail that's important to understand what really happened. So when and how did Malcolm find out about the domestic life of his teacher, the one who raised him from the state of Satan as he was in prison and cleaned him up, taught him and presented him to the world, making him an icon, a living icon as much as he is now in his death. How did he find out about his teacher's domestic life and what did it do to him? The false narrative says Malcolm X accidentally found out in late 63 that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad slept allegedly slept with secretaries and this crushed Malcolm X's faith in his teacher and as a result he could no longer represent his teacher or the teachings of the nation of Islam and so he left. That is an absolute false construction of history. Malcolm X found out. Malcolm X had firsthand knowledge of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad having taken wives. He had firsthand knowledge of that, we know, as early as 1962. How did he find out in 1962? Well, he was at the palace of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the winter of 1962. You have heard, I'm sure, Brother Malcolm and Brother King Cam, the story of two sisters and their babies outside the house of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad screaming and trying to get in. Yes, have you sir, heard sir. that story? Yes, yes sir. sir. But there's a critical detail that is never mentioned in this story. And in fact, Manny Marable in his 
account misidentifies the sisters who are involved here and misidentifies the location. And I suspect I know the reason why the misidentification. The fact of the matter is the two of the wives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Sister June and Sister Ola, not Sister Evelyn and Sister Lucille, as Manny Marble presents, Sister June and Sister Ola, they were outside the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's house with their children. All of us who are blessed to have one wife, we know if you are married, there's always some domestic strife that we experience. Now, if you are the messenger of God and you have nine wives, as the messenger of God did, then chances are that a messenger of God who has nine wives is likely to experience way more domestic strife than me, who has one wife. Yes, sir. So, there was domestic strife in the relationships of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. In this particular case, two of his wives, angry at the messenger, they were, this is 1962, they were outside his home in the winter of 62 in Chicago. It was Malcolm X who was at the palace with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Malcolm asked the messenger, can he go to, because, because of a particular situation, the messenger and those wives were dealing with, the messenger was not countenancing them at the moment. Malcolm asked the messenger, can he go to the door and talk to them? The messenger said yes. This is 1962. Winter 1962. Malcolm didn't leave the nation until March 8, 1964. Malcolm talks to the sisters, says he will give them, put them in a cab, and later the messenger will talk to them. They agreed, they left. Malcolm in 62 knew the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had taken on wives. He did not necessarily know at that moment how many or or the identity of all of the messengers' wives, but finding out and having firsthand experience in that incident of the messengers' wives and children from those wives absolutely did not destroy Malcolm's faith in the messenger. In 1962. Why? When. Another important detail. When. You listen to the ministers. Of the honorable Elijah Muhammad. During that time. What do they. How do they normally. Refer to their teacher. Either one of you. I know you know. Help share with the audience. What's the regular way the messengers ministers will address him? Dear holy apostle. Dear holy apostle. This is critical, critically important. Why? Malcolm introduced that language to the nation of Islam. It was Malcolm who began describing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as Holy Apostle. 
Why is that relevant here? Because of what was on Malcolm's mind when he addressed the messenger as holy apostle. Malcolm, back 62 and probably earlier, was teaching that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the fulfillment of the histories of the scriptural prophets. It was Malcolm X before encountering the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life. It was Malcolm X that was teaching that the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the Muhammad of the Quran. Malcolm taught this. That he, that his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, is the fulfillment of the histories of the prophets in the scripture. Malcolm was teaching this before there was any discussion of the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And from this understanding that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the Muhammad of the Quran and was the fulfillment of all of the prophets of the scripture, from that understanding, Malcolm began calling his teacher Holy Apostle. And because Malcolm was calling his teacher Dear Holy Apostle, the rest of the ministers followed suit. So that's very critical to understand why when Malcolm found out of, that his teacher had taken on wives, he was not disturbed by that fact of his teacher taking on wives because he already knew that his teacher was the Muhammad of the Quran who took on nine wives. So that part of the domestic life did not shatter Malcolm's faith. Now, there is a detail that he will later learn that did, that was a challenge to Malcolm. It wasn't that Muhammad of the Quran, who was his teacher, Malcolm's teacher, in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it was not that his teacher had taken on the nine wives that was prophesied of him. The problem came in 1963, when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's son, Wallace, was released from prison. He... Wallace, or as we will later know him, Imam Warthuddin Muhammad, when the Imam got out of prison, he was in prison for draft, so allegedly draft dodging. When he got out of prison, he called, or Minister Lewis X went to visit him in his apartment in Chicago. Wallace told Lewis X, he gave Lewis X an instruction. He said, there's something I want to tell you and Malcolm. Lewis X, of course, was an understudy, was a student in the ministry of Minister Malcolm. Wallace told Lewis X, there's something I want to tell you and Malcolm. Set it up. You all come back and I will disclose what it is I want to tell. Minister Lewis called Malcolm when he left that apartment. Malcolm decided during Savior's Day, 1963, February 1963. When he was in Chicago for Savior's Day, he decided on his own to go see Wallace without Lewis. 
Wallace told Malcolm something that did hurt him. Not that the messenger had taken on both, had taken on wise, both Wallace and Malcolm understood that general principle. Wallace disclosed to Malcolm that of the wives, one was Sister Evelyn and one was Sister Lucille. That did hurt Malcolm because as is well known now, Sister Evelyn and Sister Lucille in Malcolm's early history, they had relation they had relationships. He was engaged to Sister Evelyn for a short time. And mm. finding out that these two in particular had become wise of the honorable Elijah Muhammad, that's what hurt Malcolm's heart. Mm. He knew the he had met Sister June and Sister Ola back in ninety two. Yes, sir. He, he knew the I'm sorry, sixty two. He yes, knew sir. the messenger Muhammad had taken on wives, as was the prophecy that Malcolm was teaching us he was to fulfill. But what he didn't know until Wallace dropped that on him, that of the wives was these two sisters in particular. That yes, sir. did hurt Malcolm. Yes, sir. It hurt oh. him so much. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to just get in a little bit so um, you can get a little bit of water. And for those who are just coming in, family, again, we, we thank you for your presence here with us uh, today uh, as we go uh, and walk through the correcting of the Malcolm X narrative. Uh, for those people who are just coming into the space, family, please take the opportunity to tweet the space out. Um, to let uh, others who may be interested in hearing this conversation uh, have an opportunity to listen as well as um, possibly be able to ask a question uh, when we get to the Q&A section as well. So um, so back with the question. So, um, Dr. West, it, it, it's, it's back on you now. Okay. Yeah, so, so that's... So I, I'll wrap this part up. Okay. That was the important historical basis I wanted to lay and share that Malcolm was, was not crushed by the discovery that his teacher had taken on wives. He was prepared for that psychologically because he had already been teaching that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the Muhammad of the Quran and we know that Muhammad took on wives. Right. Yes, so 1962, Malcolm knows this. That does not crush him. What, okay. what did hurt Malcolm was the discovery that two sisters in particular had become wives. Now, right. yes, he sir. didn't handle that right. Matters of the heart are... Most of us as men, it's our Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. And when our heart is hurt, that Leviathan is awakened in all of us as men. And we have to rise above emotion into the thinking of God in order to slay the Leviathan. That's awakened mm. in us. And so Malcolm now. With a bruised heart. Right. He. Goes down. An unfortunate path. He starts yes, violating. Protocols. And starts doing things that will. He will later. Very tearfully. Very forcefully seek forgiveness of his teacher for and admit the grave error that it was but so much damage was done by then it right. eventuated in what happened May yes, 8th sir. so yes. Malcolm violates protocol and he wants to know if it's true 
So instead of going to his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and asking him and having a conversation with him, Malcolm goes and secretly visits the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's wives. Mm. And that was an error. Yes, sir. On his yes. part. And yes, so I, I will stop there for now regarding okay, yes. the wives. I, I hope the listening audience gets the two important points that I tried to stress is that no, Mal Malcolm X, his faith in his teacher was not crushed by the discovery that he had taken on wives. He was yep. perfectly sound with that. What hurt him was the discovery later that two sister sisters in particular had become his wives. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm glad that you uh, laid that base um, because that is extremely important because, as you mentioned before, that is one of the um, highlights of the false narrative. Right. Now, the second one is where we deal with Malcolm and him being silenced after the assassination of JFK. Right. And a, a key articulation of the false narrative on this point was made by Zach Kondo. Of course, brother Zach Kondo is the author of the book who was for a long time held as the definitive account on the assassination of Malcolm X. Um, Zach Kondo's book, Conspiracies Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X. Yes, sir. Brother Zach Kondo, he articulated, among all of them, but I, I particularly like his articulation of the false narrative in this <clears throat> regard. Uh, <laughs> Zach Kondo says, and make no mistake about it, the Kennedy thing was just an excuse to take Malcolm down. Mm. That's Zach, wow. brother Zach Kondo's articulation of the standard misrepresentation of this history. That Mal when Malcolm spoke the truth about JFK's assassination, when he spoke at the Manhattan Center on December 3rd, I believe it was, 3rd or 1st, I, I believe it was, uh, December 1st, I believe it was, uh, 1963, um, When Malcolm spoke the truth regarding the assassination of the president, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who had already felt threatened by Malcolm and was envious of Malcolm, used that truth that Malcolm spoke as a pretext, as an excuse to bust him and get him out of his head. That nothing could be further from the truth actual circumstances give the lie and the details of the actual circumstances give the lie to this aspect of the false narrative what actually happened this is what happened one let's be real clear by this time December well President Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, December 22nd, I'm sorry, November 22nd, 1963. By this time, Malcolm and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had already discussed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life in Phoenix. They had a conference over it, and Malcolm left that conversation 
with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, filling up in spirit. He did not um, leave that meeting in Phoenix with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad feeling crushed as Carl Evans, Carl Evans mistakenly says. He left that meeting, that conversation with the messenger regarding the messenger taking wives. He left that meeting feeling upbeat. Now, but that does not mean that there was not still matters of the heart weighing on Malcolm. But this is what happened. Friday, November 22nd, 1963. America's beloved, white America's beloved sitting president was shot down in Dallas. 12 o'clock, around 12 o'clock, 12.30 Central Time, which was 1 o'clock, 1.30 Eastern Time, where Malcolm was in New York. That evening, Friday, as Malcolm X, as the mosque was opened at 8 o'clock Friday, as was customary, Malcolm was teaching from the rostrum that Friday, as was customary. Chicago called into New York with a direct instruction from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This is Friday, November 20, Friday evening, November 22nd. Elijah Jr., Elijah Muhammad Jr., Assistant Supreme Captain and son of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He calls Temple Number 7 at around 8.30, 8.20, Malcolm's on the roster. Elijah Jr. instructs Captain Joseph, who answered the phone, to Go get Malcolm and bring him to the phone. I have a message from my father for him. Captain Joseph goes. He interrupts Malcolm. He quietly interrupts Malcolm while he's teaching from the restroom. Let's him know. There's a call. You got to take it. It's the assistant supreme captain. Malcolm is a little perturbed. He says, well, don't they know that I'm teaching? Captain Joseph's response to him is because apparently Elijah Jr. had already anticipated Malcolm's response. <laughs> so he already sent Captain Joseph with a response to Malcolm's response. Mm -hmm. And yes, that sir. response was, we start our Friday meetings at 8 o'clock. Not a minute before, not a minute after. We do this all over the nation. So, of course, we knew that Malcolm was teaching. Get him anyway, because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has a message for him. Malcolm dismounted, go, gets the phone, ask Captain Joseph, to be on the other end and these are the instructions that were given to Malcolm X the evening of November 22nd 1963 Elijah Jr. says Minister Malcolm my father he said my father says he doesn't know if you know but the president has been assassinated today so I am calling you, meaning the messenger is speaking. He's relaying the words of the messenger to Malcolm. So I'm calling or instructing all of the ministers of the nation this, but I'm calling you first. Make no comment on the assassination of, Mal of JFK of the president make no comment on the murder of the president 
Malcolm says to let me be clear. He says, make no make sure you make no derogatory comments on the murder of the president. Say nothing. Malcolm responds to Elijah Jr. Well, what am I supposed to say if I'm asked? Elijah Jr.'s response to Malcolm from his father. He said, my father says, say. We regret the death of the president. We regret the death of the president. Or we are sorry for over the death of the president. Malcolm, they hang up. Malcolm says to Joseph, I can't say that. Listen to this. He was just given a direct instruction mm. from his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And his first response is, I cannot say that. No, it was, how can I say that? Mm. I have been beaten up on the president. How can I say that? Says this to Captain Joseph. Right. Captain Joseph says, well, that's easy. You were told what to say by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Ain't no confusion. That was November 22nd. He got a specific instruction from his teacher over what to say and what not to say. And immediately, he was in rebellion. Immediately, he was in rebellion. Yes, sir. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad was scheduled to speak at the Manhattan Center in New York, December 1st, 1963. Because of the murder of the most beloved president of white people in a long time, the Honorable Elijah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's instruction to all the ministers was to keep quiet because white people were grieving. And that put Muslims on the street at risk if we spoke recklessly triggering white people and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said they would kill my followers and he did not want his followers killed. This is why he gave the instruction to keep quiet on the assassination. Because of that climate, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wasn't even going to go to Manhattan Center to speak even though a great amount of money was invested. Mm -hmm. Malcolm prevailed upon the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Said, well, let me go, allow me to go in your stead, dear Holy Apostle. The messenger said, okay. But he said, remember, Malcolm, make no comment about the assassination of the president. Malcolm said, yes, sir. Now, this is the third instruction Malcolm was given. He was given the first one personally from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad through Elijah Jr. on no the mm -hmm. evening of November 22nd. Afterwards, a universal directive came down from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad addressing all of the ministers. Say nothing about the assassination of the president and then he Malcolm gets another personal instruction from the messenger in preparation for the, the December 1st event remember Malcolm say nothing about the death of the president so he entered Manhattan Center on that day December 1st having been given three direct instructions from his teacher 
to say nothing of the assassination of the president. Mm. Yes, sir. When he got through his speech, now one other important detail, and I'll wrap this up. Detail that isn't commonly known. Everyone knows the latter part of the history. All right, doing question and answer. Malcolm was asked about the com the death of the president. Malcolm made the comment that he made. Chick is coming home to roost. Uh, everybody thinks they know that part of the history, but there's a detail that I want to close on. At the Manhattan Center, when Malcolm arrived at the Manhattan Center for that speech, he was informed by Captain Joseph that all of the press had been removed from the audience. The reason Captain Joseph had all of the press removed from the Manhattan Center is because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave an instruction that no white people can come to our events anymore because of what happened, what had happened a couple months before, either in November or October, in Flint, Michigan, when police insisted on coming into the ballroom that he was speaking at with weapons. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said white people can no longer attend our public meetings. So Captain Joseph, before Malcolm arrived at the Manhattan Center, he had turned all white people away. And these were primarily the press. Malcolm found out that this was done and in particular that Captain Joseph had turned away New York Times reporter Mike Handler. And for whatever reason, Malcolm had a fondness for Handler. When Malcolm discovered that Captain Joseph had turned the press away in Handler in particular, Malcolm was upset. When Captain Joseph explained to Malcolm why he did it, that per the instruction of the messenger, no white people can come to our meetings anymore. Malcolm instructed Captain Joseph to go and get Handler in the press. Cap Captain Joseph complied. So this is why the press were there to hear Malcolm's public rebellion now. He gets through the lecture wonderfully. And then he does something he never did at public rallies. Malcolm was known to open the mosque meeting up after the lecture for Q&A, question and answer. But he never opened up public rallies to question and answer until that day. After his lecture, he opened it up to question and answer. A brother stood up and asked him about the assassination. And instead of saying either no comment or what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad instructed, we are sorry for the loss of the president. Malcolm says, quote, I'm going to get in trouble for this. This is why we know it was rebellion. Because he knew what he was doing was wrong. He said, I'm going to get in trouble for this. He says, it's a case of the chickens coming home to roost. But he doesn't stop there. The popular narrative amputates Malcolm's statement. It makes it appear that he just spoke some high wisdom truth. Yeah, it's the case of the chickens coming home to roost. White people, white America, the government has been killing black leaders all over Africa and the world. And the violence that 
the government has sent out has now come back to take its own president. Well, yeah, that's true. But Malcolm doesn't stop there. Malcolm says, and me being a farm boy, I'm never sad when chickens come home to roost. In fact, I'm glad when chickens come home to roost. So when the press said Malcolm X happy or glad over death of the president, they were not doing violence to, Mal to Malcolm's comment. Malcolm absolutely implied that with, I'm never sad, I'm glad when chickens come home to roost. So, Malcolm engaged in public disobedience and rebellion with that comment. And so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad reprimanded him publicly because, one more thing, remember, in 1962, after Ronald Stokes was murdered by the police in Los Angeles, and Malcolm mounted the rostrum after that, and exalted in the fact that a plane of whites had went down, killing about 120 white people. And Malcolm exalted in that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad had to rebuke Malcolm for that, but he rebuked Malcolm privately. When Malcolm went rogue, if you will, again a second time, now Malcolm is rebuked publicly and nationally. But this was not a case of the messenger seizing the opportunity to silence Malcolm. Malcolm was in was guilty of open disobedience, a disobedience that had settled in his heart on November 22nd when he first got that instruction from his teacher. So he was penalized according to the laws of the nation of Islam, laws that he was happy to execute on others before that day. On that day, it was executed against him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for that, um, Dr. Wesley, because that was a, actually a part that I never knew about the uh, reporters, the press being asked to not be present at the meeting. And then Malcolm actually instructing uh, Captain Sharif to go. And, I mean, Captain Joseph to go and get um, the reporter. So that was that was new. Um, so, family, as you come in uh, to the room and to the space, man, make sure you tweet it out. We appreciate uh, everybody joining us uh, this evening. We are uh, correcting the narrative, the Malcolm X narrative, with our uh, good brother, student minister, Dr. Wesley Muhammad, who has been studying and uh, w uh, studying the uh, assassination of the murder of Malcolm uh, for the past 30 years. Um, so... We're having that discussion this evening, and I and I want to segue now because we're at that point where Malcolm has made those public statements. Malcolm now is being reprimanded publicly by the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, based on the rules and the structure of the Nation of Islam. So right. now, uh, could you walk us into uh, the next steps as Malcolm is sat down? Malcolm is instructed right. not to make any public engagements for 90 days. So could right. you go into the 90 day period and then uh, Malcolm ultimately um, detaching himself from the nation of Islam? Yes. So Malcolm's brother, Philbert X Little, who would become Omar Abdul, he was the minister of Lansing, Michigan at the time, and he 
had a close relationship with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. When Malcolm was sat down, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was in communication with Filbert. And this is what Filbert relays. Filbert says that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told him that he's sitting Malcolm down, but He's sitting them down for 90 days or he is silencing Malcolm, not sitting him down, silencing Malcolm for 90 days. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to Philbert, he, st he still has his authority on the East Coast. He was an East Coast regional minister. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to Philbert, if he can stay quiet, for 90 days. Not only will I put him back on his post. But he will have more authority after. If he could just stay silent. For 90 days. That proved to be too much of a. Trial and challenge for Malcolm. Two sets of conversations that Malcolm was having are important. One, Malcolm was desperately reaching out to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, begging to be readmitted. Understand that Malcolm never wanted to be out of the nation of Islam. It's a very important point. Malcolm X. So now... This is December 63. We roll into January and February 64. Malcolm knows about the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He knows at least several of the wives identity. He knows there's children from these wives. He had a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad about the wives but he not only did he not leave but he never wanted to during this period of trial now he's silenced he's desperately trying to get back into his position at number seven in January, he would be moved from Class C, which in Nation of Islam language means you're just, you can't mount the rostrum. Let me back up, let me clarify this. Malcolm's original disciplinary measure for speaking out of turn at the Manhattan Center. He was put in what's called Class C in the Nation of Islam. That means that if you are a minister, you're still the minister. You have not been busted from your post as minister. You still can carry out all of the administrative duties of your post as minister. You can still come to the mosque, still be among the believers in the community. The only thing you can't do is mount that rostrum at the mosque or any mosque and speak. You can't do that. And you can't mount any public rostrum and speak. And you cannot give any interviews or speak to the press. Those were the terms of Malcolm's initial punishment. Class C. Initially, Malcolm obeyed. He's writing letters to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, begging the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for forgiveness for his error. He admits that that was a grave error on his part.
He's asking for forgiveness. He's asking to be readmitted. But there's two other things that he's doing, unfortunately. While he's writing the messenger, pleading to be reinstated back in at temple number seven, the rostrum in particular. He's doing two things, though, that undercut his effort and really killed his effort. One thing he's doing is he's now talking to certain laborers about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's personal business. Now he sat down and now he's revealing to Louis X of Boston and other East Coast ministers, Malcolm is revealing these personal matters of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to these ministers. It absolutely was a secret. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life, his taking wives, absolutely was a secret in the nation. The nation was the believers at that time and this was right up out the mud and the mindset of the believers was not of a state that could have properly handled the honorable elijah muhammad fulfilling that aspect of the life of prophet muhammad so it absolutely was kept a secret the Honorable Elijah Muhammad talked to Malcolm about it in confidence. But when Malcolm was sat down, while he's writing letters to the messenger pleading, begging to be forgiven, he's, one, dropping seeds about his personal affairs to other ministers they of course when Malcolm drops these seeds on them they reach out directly to the honorable Elijah Muhammad as they should and as Malcolm should have when Wallace first dropped the seed that Wallace dropped on him Malcolm had a duty to reach out First and foremost to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Instead, Malcolm went and had a secret council with those sisters. Now Malcolm is dropping seeds to ministers about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's personal affairs. And they send letters to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad informing him. The other thing Malcolm X is doing. He's violating the terms of his C-class. He goes out to Florida with Cassius Clay, soon to be announced as Muhammad Ali. And out in Florida, he is absolutely talking to the press in violation of the terms of his C-class penalty. So he still rebelled, rebelling against the law, the structure, his teacher. On January 2nd, you know, Malcolm later will say, well, they didn't give me a, a hearing. I just want a hearing. They denied me a hearing before my peers. That is absolutely wrong. Malcolm's peers weren't the believers of temple number seven. A believer who is found guilty of an infraction or violation of the law is brought before the believers. Malcolm X was a national official. He was a national spokesperson. 
his hearing as all national spoke national laborers hearings are very different Malcolm absolutely had a hearing on January 2nd 1964 in Phoenix at the hearing was of course the Honorable the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who was the national minister as but of course the messenger of God also at that hearing was the Supreme Captain Raymond Sharif and the National Secretary John Ali. At the hearing, Malcolm's continued disobedience was put before him and he was given the opportunity to argue his case and he admitted all of the charges he was very tearful and we know this because the conversation the home of the honorable elijah muhammad in that room was bugged so we have the transcript of the hearing malcolm is pleading for mercy malcolm admits to doing it all of what was charged but he he blames wallace for taking his spirit away from him and putting him in that state that made him make the mistakes that he made. He asked for mercy from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad put Malcolm now on class F. No longer on class C. Class F is you are removed from the community. Malcolm was removed from his post as minister and he is excommunicated from the body. A Muslim who's on class F, who's put on class F, the rest of us Muslims cannot fraternize with them. We cannot even hold conversations with them. We can only give the greeting if the person on class F gives us the greeting, we can return the greeting. If we talk to a person who's on class F, we will incur the penalty that they are serving. So if this person is on class F for a year, we will bring upon ourselves a year in class F if we are caught talking or fractionizing with this person. That is Malcolm's state as a consequence of that January 2nd hearing in Phoenix. Now he's excommunicated. He's busted from his post because of continued disobedience of the law and continued disloyalty to his teacher regarding his teacher's personal life. Malcolm continues writing letters Pleading, pleading, pleading. I wrap it up. Well, there's three points, and I, I, I wrap it up. During this time, now Malcolm is desperate. Malcolm is approached by two enemies. On February 4th, I think it is, the FBI comes to Malcolm's house. And tries for what at that time is a third time to turn Malcolm as a Judas to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The FBI's initial plan for Malcolm wasn't to kill him. It was to make him a Judas to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The FBI tried three times to um, turn Malcolm. Malcolm, of course, did not wittingly do so, though Malcolm would unwittingly execute specific uh, COINTELPRO operations against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, though I do not believe he knew necessarily that's what he was doing. However, I digress. February 4th, while well, Malcolm is now, he's now on F time, he's desperately seeking to get back. 
the FBI approaches Malcolm to try to turn him. And then on the other side of Malcolm, a friend of me, somebody who posed as a friend but was an enemy of Malcolm, approached Malcolm as well. We know him as James 67X Warden, also known as James Shabazz, not the James Shabazz, a minister of the Newark Temple. This is James Shabazz, Malcolm X's right-hand man, after Malcolm left. But at this time, James 67X Warden had already left the Nation of Islam and was in a very hostile relationship with the nation. And James 67X Warden was himself approached by the FBI. Aubrey Lewis, the first black FBI agent, had approached James 67X Warden, and I document James 67X, Malcolm X's right-hand man, was Malcolm X's chief enemy and the pillar of what I call Kill Team One, the Judas team, those around Malcolm that delivered him up into the hands of his enemy. The pillar of that Judas team was James 67X Warden. Now, in February, James had been out. James left the Nation of Islam. But James shows up to Malcolm and James starts putting, dropping seeds in Malcolm's mind. Malcolm desperately wanted to get back into the Nation of Islam. It was James who convinced Malcolm he will never get back into the Nation of Islam. It is James that is telling Malcolm false stories of assassination of talk assassination talk directed at malcolm x we know the stories are false because the stories changed over the years as james told them but these stories convinced malcolm it weakened malcolm's resolve to get back into the nation of islam and then the final straw occurred March 5th, and I close on this. Malcolm had been writing Honorable Elijah Muhammad begging for forgiveness and for reentry. On March 5th, Malcolm received his reply. A letter from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The letter said to Malcolm that his suspension is indefinite but also Malcolm will never be given temple number seven again this is what the messenger says to Malcolm in that March 5th 1964 letter you will never be given New York again because if I gave you gave New York back to you, you will only set up a group there that is totally loyal to you and not Chicago. So the messenger told him he will never be the king of New York again. That was March 5th, March 8th. Malcolm X put documents in his car, drove to Mike Handler, that white New York Times reporter who Malcolm insisted should be retrieved at the Manhattan Center Malcolm X on March 8th put documents in his car and drove to Mike Handler's house and with his wife Mike Handler's this white this devil reporter to Mike in front of Mike's wife Malcolm X declares he's leaving the Nation of Islam and he presents Handler with some documents. I don't know what they are. This is what Handler says. He presented some documents 
This is why Mike Handler had to jump on the story that was published March 9th in the New York Times, Malcolm X splits with Elijah Muhammad. That's how that happened. Yes, sir. Wow. Oh. Good stuff. Good stuff. Wow. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm learning. <laughs> I'm learning a whole lot. So much more that I never heard before. Family, please, um, if you're learning something new, uh, please uh, hit the 100s in the audience. Family, hit the 100s in the audience. Um, we want to thank Dr. Wesley for his time um, to um, come and talk with us and dialogue with us in reference to uh, correcting the Malcolm X narrative. So thank you again, Dr. Wesley. And that's now we're at the point where Malcolm uh, says that he is separating from the nation of Islam. And now he's talking to the white press. And whatever documentation he sends, you know, he gives to Handler, we don't know, but he Handler says he gave him some documentation. Right. So <clears throat> Malcolm then begins to make a, a press run, if you will, uh, where he is now doing interviews and he starts to talk about the most honorable Elijah Muhammad in, um, in ways that are unfavorable. No, no, no. Yes, sir. No. Okay. And this is very important. Yes, sir. That that press talk did not begin in March. His press talk in March, when he announced his separation, was very different. The press talk you are referring to began in June. Okay, yes, sir. June is when the Rubicon River was crossed for Malcolm. And this distinction is very, very important. Let's go back to March. Malcolm's press talk is critical and it gives the lie to the false narrative. When Malcolm X, first Mike Handler in the New York Times breaks the story on March 9th, Malcolm X split from Elijah Muhammad. On March 10th or 11th, Malcolm X holds a press conference and he issues a statement and Malcolm X says, let me, in fact, I'm going to read it. Malcolm X sends a statement to the press. And he opens with this. His statement to the press on, of March 8th, 1964. There has been talk of a split between me and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. After 90 days of complete silence, I would like to make my position in this controversy crystal clear. Mr. Muhammad is the one who taught me everything I know. And the one who made me into whatever I am. Now be clear. For two years, Malcolm had known and lived with the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He even had been rebuked and punished by his teacher. But does this sound like a man whose faith in this teacher has been crushed because he found something out about his personal life? No, sir. No. He goes on. I believe Allah has given him, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the best diagnosis of the ills that besets America's 22 million Negroes. And the same God has also given him, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the only solution that will eliminate the basic causes behind our people's social, economic, political, moral, mental, and spiritual ailments. On March 11th, Malcolm pins a telegram specifically to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. This is what Malcolm says publicly. This March 11th, 1964. Quote, the national officials there at the Chicago headquarters know that I never left the nation of Islam on my own free will. See, it's not right there. Now, if 
the narrative that Malcolm X found something out about his teacher that crushed his faith and he as a result he left the nation Malcolm's March 11th 1964 public telegram to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad presents a totally different story he says this I know the national officials that are at the Chicago headquarters know that I never left the nation of Islam of, of my own free will. It was they who conspired with Captain Joseph here in New York to pressure me out of the nation. Now that's spent. Now he was in dispute with certain national laborers. This is his perspective. But what's important here is hearing Malcolm's posture toward the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's, this is what's important. Malcolm says on March 11th, in order to save the national officials and Captain Joseph, the disgrace of having to explain this forcing me out, I announced through the press that it was my own decision to leave. I did not take the blame to protect those national officials, but to preserve the faith of your follow, but to preserve the faith your followers have in you and the nation of Islam. Malcolm, why do you want to preserve the believers faith in the honorable Elijah Muhammad? Well, he goes on. He answers that. He says, despite what has been said by the press, I've never spoken one word of criticism of them about or to them about your family. I will always be a Muslim teaching what you have taught me and giving you full credit for what I know and what I am. You are still my leader and teacher, even though those around you won't let me be one of your active followers or helpers. The present course I am taking is the only way I can circumvent their obstacles and still expedite your program. Malcolm is still a lover of, a believer in, and a follower of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. This is it. These are not the words of a man whose faith in his teacher was crushed over something he found out two years ago. He continues and concludes, the tears you shed in Arizona gave the public the impression that you also are of the opinion that I left of my own free will. So I'm giving a copy of this wire to the press. May Allah bless you with health and success. I am still your brother and servant. Malcolm X. Malcolm yes, was still a believer in, a lover of, and follower of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Those were not the words of a man whose faith was crushed in his teacher because of some alleged indiscretion that he found out. I want to read one more statement. On March 19, 1964, Malcolm X was interviewed by A.B. Spellman. And in this March 19th interview, I just read his March 11th words. On March 19th, Malcolm X says this to Spellman. I did encounter opposition within the nation of Islam. Many obstacles were placed in my path, not by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, but by others who were around him. And since I believe that his analysis of the race problem is the best one and his solution is the only one, I felt that I could best circumvent these obstacles and expedite his program better by remaining out of the nation of Islam and establishing a Muslim group that is an action group designed to eliminate the same ills that the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad have made so manifest in this country. I am a follower 
of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I believe this is March 19th, 1964. After he announced his split on March 8th, he says, I am a follower of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I believe in the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The only reason I am in the Muslim Mosque Incorporated is because I feel I can better expedite his program by being free of the restraint and the other obstacles that I encountered in the nation. That's critical. It is a lie of the false Malcolm X narrative that the man who declared his separation from the nation on March 8th, 1964, was a man whose faith in his teacher was crushed. Crushed because he found out something about his teacher's personal life and he could no longer be a follower of his. Malcolm X's own words give the lie to this false narrative. Malcolm through Marx continuously made the point that he never wanted to be out of the nation of Islam. That his enemies in the nation whom he felt were jealous of him and some were that they had maneuvered to block his access to his teaching. But there's a bit of disingenuousness there because Malcolm received that March 5th letter from his teacher letting him know his teacher didn't put him eliminate him from the nation he let him know that his F, his class F was indefinite until Malcolm hears further from him but also he also indicated that whenever the Honorable Elijah Muhammad permits him back he will not be in New York so Malcolm made his strategic decision to remain out of the nation of Islam, but it had nothing to do with the domestic life of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's what's important. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I'm glad that uh, you was able to walk us through that um, to clear that up because, again, on the false narrative, it's uh, claim to fame, if you will, rides on those two um, points of the domestic life of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm being silenced um, for his comments with uh, the president, um, John F. Kennedy, and the assassination. Right. So, right. Um, family, if you have, a, if you direct your attention to the Jumbotron, you'll be able to see the letter that Dr. Wesley referenced uh, Malcolm X writing. Um, to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, March the 11th, 1964. Um, that is in the uh, Jumbotron. So you can have access to that and take a look at it uh, if you want. And so this is a... Yes, sir. No, I'm sorry. Please complete your thought. Yes, sir. So, um, so now we understand where Malcolm is at this particular point. Um, <clears throat> as he has separated himself from the nation of Islam, but still wanting to push the program of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So at what point does Malcolm now shift in his thinking and his rhetoric? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's important. And if, if it's okay, obviously we can't in one, we're not going to be able to eat this elephant in one sitting. Yes, sir. So, um, I would like to answer that question because I think that perfectly wraps up um, the discussion so far. Yes, and sir. then, may I suggest, we can open it up. We can take questions from our listeners. Um, but then, for whatever the other questions, Brother... Um, King Cam and Brother Malcolm, uh, I'm happy to come back, but I, I, I don't want to tax unnecessarily.
tax the listeners or myself by um, thinking I can go or we together can go from A to Z in this one sitting. Um, so I, I, I will wrap it up with that point because, of course, what I just said begs that question. And then we, we can open it up for a few um, questions and and then I, I will retire back to my lab if you all don't mind. <laughs> yes, sir. Beautiful. Absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, sir. <clears throat> what yes, happened? Sir. Obviously, what the Malcolm that we heard in March Is not the Malcolm we're hearing in June. Now, of course, two Im two important things happen between that Malcolm and the Malcolm of June. The first is Malcolm received notice that the Nation of Islam was taking back its residence. Malcolm's Queen's residence was owned by the Nation of Islam. As a laborer in the Nation of Islam, as an official in the Nation of Islam, Malcolm was allowed to stay in that house with his family. When Malcolm seemingly from the, honor, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's perspective. I send you a letter, Malcolm, March 5th, telling you you not get in New York back. And on March 8th, you go to the white man saying, you're leaving the Nation of Islam. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, get the lawyers whose name is on the deed that in the house that he lives in that we purchased. Oh, we own that house. Send Mr. Malcolm notice that he must leave the premises. That ended up triggering a a an emotional Descent, if I can say that, on Malcolm's part. Because Malcolm took that very personally, and he eventually saw that as a declaration of war against him. The other thing that happened was in April, Malcolm went to Mecca and feigned a religious conversion experience. He feigned a Pauline experience. When he again sent word to Mike Handler, his seemingly his BFF in the white press corps, Handler from New York Times, it was to him Malcolm sent that letter claiming to have seen for the first time white Muslims whose Eyes were the bluest of blue and skin the whitest of white. Now, of course, we know that that was disingenuous. That was false. Malcolm had been to the area in 1959. He was sent by the Nation of Islam as ambassador of the nation to set things in place for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's trip to Mecca that year. Malcolm traveled the Middle East and saw white Muslims there. Malcolm knew for a long time that there were white Muslims and Malcolm himself castigated white Muslims who treated black people the same way white Christians treated black people. Malcolm condemned the white Muslims for this while he was a minister in the Nation of Islam. So the religious conversion that Mike Handler reported of him, it was feigned. 
it was it was a strategic move on Malcolm's part. Malcolm sought alliances when he left, when he announced his split from the nation on March 8th. He sought alliances with civil rights leaders, almost all of whom rejected him. He still had the black Muslim baggage that he was carrying around with him. So all of them rejected Malcolm, especially since Malcolm had spent 12 years beating them up in order to get the black Muslim monkey off his back, if you will. He feigned a Pauline experience in Mecca. When he did that, that did anger Muslims because we knew that Malcolm wasn't being honest. We knew that Malcolm, Malcolm taught the ministers on the hypocrisy of the white Muslims. So that angered Malcolm, that angered the Muslims that Malcolm would tell that that fiction but it was June the court case over ownership of that house was scheduled for June either 14th 15th or June 15th 16th and as Malcolm got closer to that date he became more desperate and he made the calculation leading up it was the first week of June leading up to that trial over the house Malcolm thought that if he put the messenger's business out there the way he was that will force the Muslims to stand down on the house. And so Malcolm went on a scandalization tour the first week of June. By tour, I mean he contacted all of the, the press telling them about the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's domestic life but misrepresenting it to them. None of the press would touch it. None of the press would touch it. And Malcolm lamented that fact. They said, well, if you get the women to come forward, we will print the story. Malcolm began trying to get Sister Evelyn and Sister Lucille in particular and others Sister June, try to get several of the women to turn against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. <clears throat> In court, now, he's on these radio shows claiming Elijah Muhammad slept with teenage secretaries. She presented it, presented it in a very dirty in untrue manner and he knew better Malcolm X absolutely knew that they were his wives the honorable Elijah Muhammad had taken wives Malcolm knew it Malcolm understood it and Malcolm knew that these weren't little secretary or uh, teenage secretaries sister Evelyn was 26 at the time she bore her first child for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Sister Lucille was 29 at the time she bore her first child for Malcolm. So the women that Malcolm was holding up to say the Honorable Elijah Muhammad impregnated teenage secretaries that was a lie. They were not secretaries. Oh, I'm sorry, they were not teenagers at all when they bore the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, his children, and Malcolm knew that they were his wives. And when Malcolm 
finally went to court on June, it was June 15th and 16th. And now he's under oath in the public, on the radio stations, in the press. Malcolm uses the language teenage secretary. But under oath in the court of law, Malcolm says, quote, I told Joseph that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had taken on nine wives. Throughout that proceeding, while he is under oath, he never uses the language teenage secretaries. He always uses the language wives. And then he left court where he describes the relationship of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to these women correctly, describes them as wives. He leaves court and in front of the press with his men surrounding him, says, makes the infamous remarks that he made referring to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's wives as teenage secretaries. Yes, this enraged the believers. Absolutely. But Malcolm triggered this. Malcolm triggered the rage. Malcolm was wrong for doing that. Malcolm was desperate. And in this desperation, he made a calculation, but it was a very dangerous calculation. And yes, every Muslim worth our, worth our salt had death in our heart for Malcolm for that. We didn't apologize for that then. And I don't apologize and we don't apologize for feeling that way now. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was the one who was being scandalized, who was being lied on, who was being misrepresented by the student that he had poured the most in, he gave instructions. Leave Malcolm alone. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as I close, even in his hurt at what his student was doing to him and against him. Even in his hurt, he had envisioned Malcolm returning to the nation of Islam repenting. He didn't want a martyred Malcolm X. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad visioned a repentant Malcolm X. And he said that Malcolm X coming back to the nation would be a greater boon, if you will, for the nation than before Malcolm left. And Malcolm was on his way back to the nation, or he was trying to get back to the nation before he died. But, but, he had set off. He exploded a, a bomb and he spoke what he spoke and we, because we could not put hands on Malcolm. We were given instructions. We could not touch Malcolm. It was hands off Malcolm from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So the only thing we could do to respond to Malcolm's evil against his teacher was right, was to put pen to paper. We couldn't put fist to cuffs. We certainly couldn't put bullets in guns because we were prohibited from carrying or using guns. The only thing we could do to respond to Malcolm's evil against his teacher was to put pen to paper. And so we did. He fought, we fought back, and unfortunately, those who killed Malcolm on February 21st, 1965, are the ones who, exact, who actually created this very situation and then fueled the flames of it. And then after they killed them, killed Malcolm, these people, 
in the FBI documents took credit for that conflict and the death that followed. But that's how Malcolm X of March became Malcolm X of June. In this desperation to stay in that house, he made a calculus that it just was yes, a sir. bad calculus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. So we're going to go ahead and um, close the c close the button on that chapter um, of the discussion tonight, family. Um, perfectly, perfectly said, uh, Dr. Wesley. Um, and that actually segues into the next question for another time. So now <clears throat> what we want to do is open it up for Q&A. We want to open it up for Q&A. And what we're going to do, family, is we want to allow you to have your questions and you're going to be allowed to come on stage. You're going to ask your question and then you're going to be put back into the listening audience so Dr. Wesley can respond to the question. So I, 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 I have at, at most 30 minutes. So it's a yes, sir. 830 my time. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, sir. I'm central. Um, okay, yes, sir. All right, family. So, uh, for those who have questions, please put your hands up. I would like to uh, go ahead and bring you to the stage. I'm going to uh, start with our sister. And we do have sisters first, brothers. So, I'm going to start with the sister. Uh, sister Tamara, you are first. Go ahead, sister. Well, real quick, real quick. Real quick, I just wanted to tell everybody, if you can, look in the Jumbotron. We got Brother Dr. Wesley's information up top. Can you please go to his website and uh, purchase some of his written material? Can you also follow him on Instagram as well? And, uh, and please uh, leave your questions limited to a minute to two minutes. Thank you. Go ahead, Sister T. It's on you, Sister Tamar. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Praying all is well with you and your family. Wa alaikum salam, ma'am. Thank you. I pray the same for you and yours. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for coming and speaking with us today. My question is, um, we know that we've been vindicated of Malcolm's death, but there are yes. those who um, still believe that, you know, the minister created the atmosphere or we had something to do with Malcolm's death. So how would we go about um, I wouldn't say convince how would we go about you know telling them that we didn't have anything to do with Malcolm's death and so they can if that can be like wrapped up within their mind so they can stop spinning this false narrative that the, that the nation of Islam has something to do with Malcolm's death okay yes thank you um, to parts of that question that I hear. Uh, I would ask Brother King Cam or Brother Malcolm, whoever is posting the documents, yes, I would sir. ask that you post, you put up as a teaser for future conversation, the series of documents beginning with the conspirators concentric circles and that series that follows that that has it should have the White House and the CIA this is the architecture of the assassination the White House the graph of the White House and the CIA the graph of the FBI the graph of Bossy, the graph of Kill Team 1, the Judas team, and the graph of Kill Team 2, the Shooter team. If you could post those graphs, Sister Tomorrow. Yes, these, sir, we on it right now. <clears throat> these graphs identify the architecture of the assassination of Malcolm X. It identifies by name and image 
the key players who were part of the operation that targeted Malcolm that eventually led to his death. So to answer the second part of your question, then I'll double back to the first part of your question. How do we persuade the public that the Nation of Islam was not responsible for the murder of Malcolm X. We can give them the actual facts. This is the architecture of the assassination of Malcolm X. These are the people who were part of the operation that targeted Malcolm X. So, the family of Malcolm X, through attorney Crump, they're suing the United States government for wrongful death of Malcolm X. They are suing the CIA, the FBI, and the NYPD. And that is appropriate. The White House, what, what has to be understood is, while I'm happy that this suit includes the CIA in it, the CIA is an arm of the White House. And Malcolm's murder was an executive action, meaning it was an assassination that originated with the president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. Dr. Wesley. Yes. Yes, sir. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off, but I don't want to give too much on that because that's getting into Agreed. Yes, sir. Agree. Yeah. Agree. So, yeah. so, so I'm asking you to post those as a teaser. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Post, yeah, it's been po posted. Po post those as a teaser, and we'll come back and discuss it. So, you can show, sister, tomorrow. Show the people who's really responsible for the death of Minister Malcolm. Now. The first part of your question referred to the climate and the claim that Minister Farrakhan and or the Muslims created the, the climate. No, we did not. We did not create the climate. Facts disabuse us of that false narrative. When Malcolm announced his split from the nation while he was still he, he still held the honorable Elijah Muhammad up in high regard but Malcolm publicly held up for ridicule by name laborers of the nation of Islam Malcolm started the media war against the nation. Malcolm was the media aggressor. He charged through the New Amsterdam News Minister Henry, the assistant minister in New York, and Captain Joseph charged them in the press with seeking to kill him. Malcolm initiated the media aggression and Malcolm initiated the physical aggression. Again, while Malcolm was showing all this love for his teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he at the same time was sending his armed men to the Shabazz restaurant, the Temple Number no. 7 restaurant, Sent, he sent his armed men there to bully officials of Temple Number no. 7. When the officials called the police on Malcolm, they left, but then came back and threatened those officials with their guns that to not do this, not do that giving them orders and instructions under threat of violence with firearms. 
Malcolm did this. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's response to that. This was in March. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad's response to that was <clears throat> he told his New York officials to go to the police and let them know what Malcolm is doing and let them know that if they don't stop Malcolm, we will stop Malcolm. This is what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, that's how the Honorable Elijah Muhammad responded. So, the media aggression began in March for Malcolm. It wasn't directed against his teacher, but it was directed against the nation and our officials. The physical aggression began with Malcolm sending his armed men to bully officials in the nation. So, the climate was not created by us. We spoke into a climate, but Malcolm, Malcolm was a critical initiator of the climate that will balloon out of control by the time the Honorable Minister Farrakhan spoke or wrote his words in the Final Call newspaper, I'm sorry, in the Muhammad Speaks newspaper that was December 4th, 1964. By that time, Malcolm had did what he did. We had responded. And so the climate was very hot, but the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's words, Minister Louis X at the time, are worth ending on. His words were, such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death, and given what he did to the man who gave him life, not physical life, but spiritual, intellectual, moral life, given what he did to his teacher and benefactor. We did feel, rightly so, that he was worthy of death, but Minister Lewis X continued, and this is what's important. Such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death and would have met with death if it had not been for Muhammad's confidence in Allah for victory over the enemy. Of course, Minister Lewis X is referencing the hands-off Malcolm instruction that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had in place. That's the reason Malcolm lived almost a year after he was out of the Nation of Islam and certainly a half a year after things really got hot in June. The reason he lived so long is because of the Muslims, every one of which did have death in our heart for him, but we couldn't touch him because we were under instruction. And I'm going to tease this. The only ones the government can, could get to participate in the murder of Malcolm X were Muslims who were not active in the nation at the time, they had already either left the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because they left the temple or they were put out of the nation at the time because they were already disobedient to our law and our way. And those are the ones the government was able to conscript into the plot to kill Malcolm by offering them money. But every active member every active follower of the honorable Elijah Muhammad we stood down as we were instructed to so the, what I'm saying is no the minister did not create the atmosphere he spoke into it as many did but it's an atmosphere that Malcolm X himself absolutely is greatly culpable of Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. 
uh, Dr. Wesley. And uh, we're going to go to uh, Brother Ben uh, now with his question. Yes, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. There is a uh, audio that many of us have heard on YouTube about the uh, the apology uh, Malcolm X gave to um, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Now, there's been yes, arguments and back and forth over the years. Uh, well, no, nah, he was apologizing about this. or No, nah, that was this year. So have you been able to confirm the year um, of that audio tape? Well... <clears throat> So, I know of that one, and I know of another one that's different from that, that was played by um, Gil Noble, either Gil Noble or Tony Brown. He played the letter that Malcolm wrote and put on audio and this one is in January January 1964 he's plead is after he got put on C time I'm sorry after he got put on F time he's now put out the nation uh, we got that transcript we got the recording the specific one you're referring to it's of the same nature. No, I, I have not come across a date of it, but it is no, I'm sure that one was written around the same time of the first one, meaning the first one I just referenced, the January 1964. What we know, according to Malcolm's own words, he, throughout the month of January and February, he continuously wrote letters pleading with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to reinstate him, allow him back into the fold. And we know that several of them he submitted to audio. So my assumption is that that particular letter, audio letter, was written during that same time, sometime Jan in the period of January 1964 to February 1964. That's my assumption. It's of the same nature as the other one we have that is dated. He still, um, no, his mindset or his disposition is the same. So my assumption, though I have not, brother, been come across a confirmed context of that audio when you put it alongside the January 1964 audio it's very clear that um, they originated in the same context same general context so I would say I'm pretty confident that it it, it was done sometime January February 1964 that is not, of course. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's not a letter. That's not a January, February, nineteen sixty-five letter. It is the case that, well, I have, I do not believe that at all to be the case. It is the case that Malcolm X was negotiating with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in the days before he was murdered, February nineteen sixty-five. It is the case that there was talks held between the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm, or at least representatives of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm, to, for Malcolm to return to the Nation of Islam. We have that in several documented sources that these negotiations were taking place in February 1965. But the language, if, if a tape were to be produced from that time period, I have no reason to believe it would sound like that tape that you're referencing. Uh, because a lot had changed by then. So, um, 
while that audio is authentic, I'm, I believe it to be produced in the period January, February 1964. But we also know that January, February 1965, on the eve of Malcolm's murder, he was absolutely attempting and negotiating, engaging in talks for his re-entry back into the Nation of Islam. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, Dr. Weston. Yes, All right. Sir. So we had, I thought we had somebody from the audience. Did they drop off, um, Brother Malcolm? No, he, he, for some reason, he couldn't connect. His audio couldn't connect. Um, so we okay. just have to go to Brother uh, Montreal. But if okay. anybody want to, uh, y'all have any questions, Brother Dr. West, we don't have that much time. But if you want to get a question in, you know, try, try to, you know, raise your hand. Right, and question in reference to what we discussed uh, today. So make sure we, we keep it framed on what we the information that Dr. Weston gave today. Um, Brother Montrell, let me get you up to speak. I'm, a, I'm already here, brother. I'm on the... Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm sure. <laughs> All right, yeah, go ahead, brother. As-salamu alaykum, uh, sir. Wa alaykum salam, sir. So my question was, why do you think that people, the people that love Malcolm... Uh, tend to write off the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, even after Malcolm stated multiple times in letters and documents that we read today and heard from you today, um, that everything he got was from the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad and that he never left the Nation of Islam of his own free will. So why do you think they disregard that um, when, you know, when they're speaking about Malcolm? All right. Um, probably... Brother Montreal, because to acknowledge the source of Malcolm's greatness, the things that make us love Malcolm, to acknowledge the source of that puts us in a position where, well, why don't you go get what Malcolm got? But you have to go to where Malcolm got it. And the life, the way of the nation of Islam still seems very burdensome to a critical mass of our people. And yes, it ain't easy to walk the walk of an FOI or an MGT. It ain't easy being a disciple of Jesus, especially in the hour where this world is determined to kill, to crucify Jesus. It's not easy being made into a God. And because the nation of Islam, the mosque, is a way of life designed specifically to bring out both God and devil in us in order to kill the devil and live fully in the God of us. That's, that's what this life is meant to do. So it is hard, but being a black God, a living God, is a very difficult undertaking. So most of our people, they are attracted to the nation. And what they love most in Malcolm X is... The Malcolm X that was the fruit of the nation of Islam. Let's be real clear. While people like to show the picture of the bearded Malcolm who came back from Mecca. But the Malcolm that was spitting fire at white folks that every, all, everybody loved. That's the Malcolm that was under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So it's Minister Malcolm X. Did everybody love, even though they attribute all of that to post Mecca Malcolm X with the beard who was talking very differently. So they love the Malcolm X that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam gave the world. But they don't want to walk the walk that made Malcolm great. They see it as too burdensome. So they use. Malcolm as an excuse, they use the false narrative as an excuse to justify loving the fruit but hating the tree. 
staying away from the tree that produced the fruit. Being emotionally bound to the false narrative gives them peace of mind. Loving the fruit, but hating the tree. The nation of Islam is the tree that produced Malcolm. They love the fruit, but they, they don't want the obligations that come in here puts on them. That's my opinion, dear brother. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, yeah. so we got a couple brothers on stage. Um, we got uh, your good brother and we got King Gax. Your good brother, you was up here first, so go ahead and ask your question, dear brother. Yes, sir. Your God, brother. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, sir. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Brother, the brother doctor. My God, brother, brother Reginald. Yes, sir, brother doctor. Oh, the the <laughs> the mighty God responsible for that awesome track, Shadows. Praise be. Y'all should y'all should check that out, my brother. Um, with um, musical assistance, as I understand from brother Warren, they put an awesome track together. Um, the Shadows. It's on my ig page check it out it's on his it's an awesome track that um puts some of this history um in 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 musically in an awesome way i appreciate you yes brother Reg. i appreciate you brother dr wesley i my question is regarding this uh media person i believe it's handler mm -hmm. um is there any post any post Malcolm writings or documents or anything that you have regarding him? Like he just seemed to disappear after the murder of uh, Malcolm. Well, he wrote the forward to the autobiography. Now I don't know if his forward was in the original publication, but it certainly at the beginning of the autobiography as it's made available around the world today. Um, beyond that, no, I have not, but I have not um, sought to track down his history. So I don't know if there is or is not uh, material on Mike Handler's whereabouts and activities after his involvement in the Malcolm X operation. I don't know the answer to that, dear brother. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, brother. Your guy, brother. Uh, we're going to move you back down. Next, we're going to move to uh, brother King X. Assalamualaikum, brother Wesley. Wa alaikum salam. So, um, if I heard you correctly, you were stating that the most honorable Elijah mom had nine wives. And, uh, yes, sir. In Brother Demetri's book, I only count seven wives. Um, who mm -hmm. are the other two wives? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't have, even though I have two copies of Brother Demetri's book, two different editions. And if there were a third, I would make sure I had that one as well. Everybody should get Brother Demetri's book. But I don't have it in front of me, so I, I don't know which wives he lists and which wives are left out. Nor do I know, personally, the identity of all nine. I don't know that I know. So, no, I know that, the, that Minister Malcolm repeatedly stressed the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's nine wives. And, of course... This is an aspect of the history of Prophet Muhammad that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad fulfilled. But I do not know the identity of all nine or of all of the children that were produced. I do not have that information. Yes, Personally. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that question. We, we'll take one more. Uh, we'll take one more um, question, and then we gotta get ready to let Doctor Wesley go. He was uh, 
very gracious of giving us his time and spending that time with us. And he even told us that we can, you know, do another part to this. So I guess we'll make a, you know, a small little mini series just so we can get through it. And because uh, Dr. Wesley has a lot of information, and he's also coming out with a book as well. And um, so we we'll allow Dr. Wesley to also uh, talk about his book before we get up out of here. Um, I'm trying to bring in Liv and about. Um, so you can ask your question or Alonzo X, either one that can connect. Liv and about fell off. So Alonzo, if you can come on, we'll let you be the last question. For some reason, it's not letting some of y'all come up here. He, okay, there he's on it. It's on you, brother Alonzo. Brother Alonzo, you there? Thank you. You there, dear brother? Yeah, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Now yes, sir. Can. You have a question? Hey, bro, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Can, yeah. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Do you have a question? No, there wasn't. Okay, so we're going to... I think he can... I think we can hear him. He can't hear us. Yeah, we can We can hear him. Yeah, I, I can hear him now. Can you, you guys can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. Do you have a question? You have yes, a question? sir. My, my question was a follow-up to the question that was just asked. If the identities of the wives can't be identified, how, how can we definitively can we definitively say? I know we have the the, the ages of Sister Steel and Sister uh, Evelyn; uh, those ages, as they were listed in that article um, that Malcolm uh, took to court. Uh, but the, if, if there were nine, and we don't have all the identities, how can we def uh, definitively defend? the point that they were not teenagers right uh two thank you for that question yes sir two answers one it is not the case that we cannot identify all nine wives i said i did not know the ident identity of all nine i expressed only a personal limitation to my knowledge Certainly, the nine are known. I just don't know. I just can't put a name and face to all nine and all of the children that were produced. Secondly, and most importantly, there is only one source for the claim and language teenage secretaries. Only one source of the claim that they were teenagers and that is Malcolm and Malcolm specifically held up as these teenage secretaries to women that were not teenage secretaries so Malcolm's charge doesn't rest on the identity of all nine Malcolm's charge specifically rested on the women that he did his best that he had hoped to bring a paternity case against the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's Sister Evelyn and Sister Lucia. So you don't have that claim of teenager outside of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X made it on the basis of the two women that he held up to the world. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, Dr. Wesley. All right, so at this uh, juncture, family, we are going to uh, go ahead and start to uh, close this down again. As Brother Malcolm mentioned, Dr. Wesley has been gracious enough to uh, spend some time with us here this evening, and he uh, has agreed to come back. So we don't want to belabor the point. So, Dr. Wesley, could you just speak a little bit on your book um, that is coming out and any upcoming uh, speaking engagements uh, that you may have? Yes, well, coming out, inshallah, if it be the will of Allah, of course, we, we have produced a three-volume work 
on the subject, three volumes, 1,000 pages, 3,000 footnotes. Well, the title is The Real Judas Factor, Unraveling the Mystery of the Murder of Malcolm X. Now, uh, it will be released if the Honorable Brother Minister Farrakhan, my teacher, uh, permits it to be. He is reviewing it. Um, and so I await the decision of my teacher regarding upcoming events. We will be, Allah willing, at the infamous Jekyll Island the first weekend of April. We will be speaking in the very room that the conspiracy of six men, the conspiracy of six men took place resulting in the criminal Federal Reserve. We are speaking on Jekyll's Island, Jekyll Island in that very room um, Saturday, April 1st, I believe. First or second? Yes, sir. The first, um, I believe. April 1st. And Sunday, we will be speaking to the South. Um, so, that is where we, that's our next stop on this train. Um, I hope those of you in the Georgia area will meet us there. Yes, sir. Thank you for that, Dr. Wesley. Are there any uh, closing remarks that you would like to um, say to the audience before we go ahead and uh, close now? Um, no, I, I appreciate this conversation. I enjoyed it very much. Again, uh, uh, you would say, well, you did all the talking. <laughs> <laughs> don't invite your brother <laughs> if you don't want to um, witness a deep dive. Yes, sir. Yes. That's what I do. <laughs> I'm, 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 well, I'm, we I'm, want that deep dive. <laughs> I'm special. I'm special op. So you got to have, you only call me if you want to dive deep. Yes, sir. No, we certainly enjoy um, it. So I, 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 I appreciate the club, the questions the conversation and inshallah we'll be back to finish the conversation yes sir yes sir thank you again uh, how about how about next tuesday brother dr wesley well you're not gonna get me to commit publicly <laughs> but let's, okay. let's talk about it offline and see see what we can do i need to i don't know what's going on for with me next tuesday we're, okay. we're talk about it offline. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Family, there you have it. Well, well, like slide, All right, family. There you have it. Um, Dr. Wesley, he gave us the teaser at the top. Yes, so sir. Whenever we can uh, uh, hash out and figure out, you know, a next date that we where we can bring our brother back on. Like I said, he's been so gracious and willing to do a part two to this because I've been getting inboxes of people wanting to know who actually, you know, had our brother assassinated, right? And uh, so he definitely left us with a cliffhanger and he's def and he definitely is prepared and equipped to deal with that question. We just didn't have enough time today. You know, yes, sir. that's all. Absolutely. You, you know, so uh, we are definitely grateful for you all for showing up listening sharing the space and uh just being great thanks yes sir and um just to add on to that family uh again thank you all as for those who uh who visited the space who tweeted out the space uh and enjoyed uh this conversation as much as i did so for any updates make sure that you follow the hosts and the co-hosts uh, for all updates on when we will be coming back uh, to bring a part two to this discussion. Um, and again, family, thank you again. And I host uh, Twitter spaces pretty uh, sporadically on, on, on Twitter. So just make sure you follow me on all social media platforms. It's on you, uh, Brother Malcolm Flex. 
Yes. Um. And again, I don't know if it was already said. If you can see the collective uh, Twitter page at the top as the as the host, please follow that page. That is the collective's page, and uh, also uh, follow uh, everybody up on stage if you can. Brother Ben, uh, did you have anything to say? No, sir. Besides just appreciate everybody for tuning in. Thank you all for being respectful with your questions. Great questions, by the way. And uh, follow the collective for more conversations and dialogues like so. Oh, yeah. Well, like so I mean, real quick, Brother Ben is live streaming on YouTube right now. So don't get upset with him. Uh, <laughs> please go and follow Brother Ben on YouTube. And uh, so... So just in case if you can't watch it, you know, or listen to it on Twitter Spaces, he's also uh, live streaming uh, these uh, shows on his YouTube as well. So go and follow the brother on YouTube as well. And uh, we can definitely end this room. But again, we thank you all. We appreciate you all. Y'all are the best uh, part of Twitter. You know, we love y'all. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Peace and assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. And then just quickly, quickly before we go, go out, make sure that you follow the collective on YouTube as well.